Welcome to lesson 21 dealing with electric charge and induced charge. This lesson is in two sections. We'll start with the electric charge section. We'll, get, we'll begin with some basic facts about electricity. Hopefully these are things that you have heard of before in a previous science course. The first fact is that all matter is made of atoms and these atoms are built of three subatomic particles. Protons, which are positively charged electrically, neutrons, which are neutral in electrical charge, and electrons, which are negative in electric charge. All of electricity is a result of the interaction of two of these particles, protons, which are positively charged, and electrons, which are negatively charged. The locations of the protons are in the nucleus, the neutrons are also in the nucleus, and the electrons are in the orbitals. These particles are important enough that we'll write down some facts about them, specifically about their electric charge and their masses. So I'm going to draw a table here and describe each of these particles. We'll begin with the proton. The electric charge of the proton is positive and in a certain set of units we'll use in the international system, MKS units, we're going to call the units coulombs. So the charge of the proton is positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. We use this symbol Q for representing quantity of electric charge. That may remind you of Q for quantity of heat. Here we're seeing that we're using a similar symbol for different things, um, but the context should tell you what it is. The subscript P tells you that it's a proton. The charge on the proton is positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Frequently, though, we will express the charge in terms of elementary charges, and the elementary charge E, that symbol, is going to represent this magnitude of charge in coulombs. So we would say the charge on the proton is plus E, or sometimes you'll, you'll see it written as plus 1. The mass of the proton is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Frequently you'll see this written in terms of something called atomic mass units. The atomic mass unit is based on the mass of the proton, and so we would say that the mass of the proton is one atomic mass unit, or one AMU. Already you can see that there are a couple of conversion factors that will be used from time to time. E for elementary charge and AMU for mass, and we will, um, I'll write the conversion factors up here to the upper right so that you can see what they are. The next subatomic particle we'll mess with is the neutron. The neutron has no electric charge, so we say that its charge is zero. Its mass is a little bit more than the mass of the proton, slightly more, 1.68 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. But in terms of atomic mass units, that is almost one atomic mass unit. So we would say that the mass of the neutron is one AMU as well. And then we have the electron. The magnitude of the charge on the electron is equal to the magnitude of the charge on the proton, but it's opposite in sign. So we're going to say that the charge on the electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, or negative E, or negative 1. And it's found that the electron has a very small mass compared to the proton and the neutron. The mass of the electron is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. This is about 1800 times less than the mass of the proton and the neutron, and so for all practical purposes, the mass of the electron is zero in atomic mass units. So when you're looking at atoms, it turns out that the mass of atoms is found mostly in the nucleus where the protons and the neutrons are. The electrons basically contribute very little to the mass of atoms. Another basic fact that you have learned in previous courses is that when objects become electrically charged, it's as a result of a transfer of electrons between the object. 
One object becomes positively charged if it loses electrons, so now there's a deficiency of electrons, more protons than there are electrons. And likewise, an object becomes negatively charged if it receives electrons, and so it has an excess of electrons. An important point to consider here is that it is the electrons that are doing the moving. It's the electrons that leave one object and go to the other object. And when we get to talking about electric current, it's going to be the motion of electrons through a solid conductor that is going to determine how much electricity, how much current is flowing in a conductor. The idea is that the protons are buried deep in the nucleus and those tend to be fixed in place. They don't move around. It's the electrons that are doing the moving. Another important fact is that when you have charged objects, they can exert forces, electrical forces on each other. If the two objects have the same sign of electric charge, then they exert forces that push each other away. And if they have opposite signs of electric charge, then they tend to pull each other together. And we summarize this by saying that like charges repel and unlike charges attract. In a future lesson, we're going to develop something called Coulomb's Law, which will tell us what the strength, the magnitude of the force is based on the characteristics of the object. But for right now, we'll leave it that if two objects have the same sign of charge, they will exert repulsive forces, whereas if they have opposite signs of charge, they'll exert attractive forces. Another important fact that you've learned in a previous course is that there are three main methods of charging objects electrostatically. Those three methods are charging by friction, charging by conduction, and charging by induction. Let's remind ourselves of what each of these methods means. And in fact, we're going to dedicate the second part of this lesson to induction. Charging by friction. In this situation, you have two objects maybe a piece of cloth and a wand of some sort that are made of different materials. And these two cloths rub, these two objects rub beside each other. And as a result of the contact, electrons get stripped off of one object and deposited onto the other object. The mechanism for this is that one of the objects has atoms in it that are more electronegative than the other object. So when they're in close proximity with each other, the electron-hungry object tends to pull electrons away from the other object. So the more electronegative object tends to become negatively charged, and that leaves the other object positively charged. Now notice there is, there's no charge that's created. There's no charge that's destroyed. The amount of charge, the total amount of charge is conserved, but the charges are rearranged, and as a result of this rearrangement, then you end up with a positive object and a negative object. It's also important to note at this point that the sign conventions for determining electric charge come to us from founding father of America, Benjamin Franklin, and his work in electricity. And it's important to know what these sign conventions are. Franklin said that if a piece of hard rubber is stroked with animal fur, then the sign of charge that ends up on the rubber is negative. And if the rubber got its negative charge from the electrons that came from the animal fur, then that means that the corollary to this is the animal fur is positive. But Franklin focused on the rubber wand. In a similar way, if a glass wand is stroked by silk, then the glass becomes positive. And in a similar way, the reason the glass is positive is because the silk strips some electrons away, and that leaves the silk negative. The next method of charging is charging by conduction. And it involves touching a charged object to another usually neutral object. As a result of this contact, then there is a transfer of charge, and after that transfer has occurred, 
then both objects have the same sign of charge as the originally charged object was. If I started with a negatively char charged wand and I bring it up to a neutral object and touch the wand to the object, then some electrons depart from the charged wand and go on to the neutral object so that both objects end up with an excess of electrons and we have both objects negatively charged. On the other hand, if I took a glass wand and I touched it to a neutral object, then some electrons will depart from the neutral object and come on to the wand. Not enough to neutralize the positive charge on the wand, but enough to cause an excess of protons or deficiency of electrons on the originally neutral object so that both objects will end up with a positive charge. The third method of charging is charging by induction and we're going to dedicate the second part of this lesson to charging by induction. So I'm not going to I'm going to leave it at this point and we'll come back to it in a few minutes. The last important basic fact about electricity that we're going to raise at this point is that there are certain objects that allow electricity to move easily. We call them conductors. And there are other objects that prevent the easy motion of electrons and they're called insulators. So materials can be classified either as conductors or insulators according to how easy it is for the electricity to move along the object. You handle, conduct, you handle conductors and insulators every day. Anytime you plug in an electric cord in a socket, you're handling rubber insulation that surrounds a copper conductor, and the electricity will then flow along the copper, but doesn't flow along the rubber. The rubber prevents easy movement of charge, but the copper allows the easy movement of charge.